Robin, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Pray podcast today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Can you give myself and the audience a little background about who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I'm a professor at Clemson University. I've been there for almost 20 years. Um, my um, degree is in social psychology, um, and I do research, broadly speaking, on uh, aversive interpersonal behaviors, um, specifically um, cyberbullying. Um, and I got into that field of cyberbullying because um, when I first came to Clemson, I had been doing research on bullying and teasing, um, traditional bullying, schoolyard mm -hmm. bullying. And um, at the time that I came to Clemson, so like I said, about 20 years ago, the um, cyberbullying was just starting to be talked about and, um, you know, the research on it was just starting. So it just seemed sort of a natural progression to start, you know, moving in that direction with the research. And given that my broad focus was on aversive interpersonal behaviors and bullying in general, it really was, was just a natural sequence to go into that area. And um, it has exploded in terms of the research attention that's been devoted to it um, and the prevalence of the behavior, unfortunately. Yeah. So for those of us that are older, let's talk a little bit about what kind of the traditional bullying is. I think those who those of us who grew up and graduated high school prior to the late 90s probably have no clues to what cyberbullying is. So can we draw some comparisons to what it would be uh, a little more of what it would be for people in our age group of what it would look like when we were kids? Sure. So, so when we talk about traditional bullying, um, you know, the, the person whose name is most often associated with traditional bullying is Dan Alvarez, and, and we all use his definition of traditional bullying. So it's an aggressive act. It's intended to cause harm or distress. The behavior is typically repeated over time. Um, it occurs among individuals for whom there's a power imbalance. Um, and we, you know, we talk about victims and perpetrators, but there's typically a power imbalance between those, those people. Um, and so when, when we started doing research on cyberbullying, we just adapted that definition mm -hmm. um, to fit cyberbullying. And for the most part, um, it, has, it has fit. Um, you know, cyberbullying is also an aggressive act. Um, it's typically intended to hurt somebody else, um, but most of the time. Um, it, it is also typically repeated over time, but repetition in the online world takes a different form. You know, mm -hmm. if I, if I send a, if, if I'm the perpetrator and I send a single email, but I send it to hundreds of people that has a repetitive quality to it. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's repetition in a different form. Or if I only, you know, if I send an inflammatory email, but I send it to one person, but that person reads it over and over and over again, that also has a repetitive quality to it. Gotcha. The power imbalance that has always characterized traditional bullying, you know, bullying that typically occurs at school during the school day, um, that has been debated in the literature about the extent to which that applies to cyberbullying. What most of us feel is that it, it applies, particularly if you're talking about elementary, middle, and, um, and high school youth, you know, in the adult world, it, it may differ a little bit, but, um, but among, you know, young people, the, the power imbalance takes a different form though. You know, if I, and more technically, um, te uh, more savvy with technology than somebody else, then that affords me in the online world a great deal of power. Mm -hmm. We also know that, uh, and I'm going to use the term perceived anonymity. Um, the perceived anonymity in the online world also affords a potential perpetrator a great deal of power. So if I can hide under an umbrella of anonymity, then that's going to afford me a great deal of power relative to the person that I am targeting. Um, you know, they don't know if it's their best friend doing it. They don't know if it's a sibling doing it. They don't know if it's a stranger. And there's a real unnerving quality to that. Um, I don't in any way want to minimize, you know, traditional or schoolyard bullying. But if I know, you know, if, if you are the perpetrator of schoolyard bullying, um, you know, again, not to minimize it at all, but at least you are a known quantity to me. And if I yeah. see you walking down the hallway at school, I can do everything I can to avoid you. In the virtual world, if I don't know who you are, how, how can I avoid you? And even if I turn off my, you know, incoming messages, if I don't go to a website where somebody's told me, you know, messages are being left about me, I, I, I'm still hearing that they're being left. Yeah. And, you know, there's always that temptation to want to go see, you know, I want to know what's being said about me. Um, and the consequences are, are very harmful. I'll, I'll also say that we know that there's a high degree of involvement in the two types of bullying. 
we know that people that are involved in traditional bullying also tend to be involved in, in cyberbullying. How great that overlap is depends on what, what publication you read. Um, you know, Dan Alvaeus, uh, um, like I said, who's involved with, um, who, who was involved with so much traditional bullying, he said uh, only 10% of people involved with cyberbullying who are not also involved with traditional bullying. So there's a 90% overlap. The research that we've done uh, has found a correlation or a relationship, um, a, a more moderate relationship um, uh -huh. between the, the two. Really doesn't matter what the number is. It's the fact that, you know, particularly young people are typically involved in both types of, of bullying. So from a school's perspective, for example, if you're involved in one type, you know, if, if you're trying to develop prevention intervention programs, you need to to ask about involvement in others. So I, I guess the question that arises is why, uh, I guess there's two ends of the question is why, why do people who bully, bully? I mean, fr from, from my growing up, it was always, you know, they don't have a good relationship with their dad or uh, that it was, they were bullied as uh, by their parent or an adult. And that's the only way they know how to interact with people. Is that, is there any truth to that sort of so, um, yeah, so it could be, it could be a family situation. It could be that they, you know, that they have been bullied in the past. Um, so from a traditional bullying perspective, mm -hmm. they, maybe they bully because they've been, they've experienced bullying at home and they're just, you know, they can't, it's because of that power differential, they can't take it out on their parents. So they're going to take it out on somebody who has less power than they do at home. Um, you know, maybe somebody who has been a victim of traditional bullying at school is, you know, maybe they're um, smaller in stature, maybe they are physically weaker, maybe they have less um, social status, um, so they can't bully in a traditional sense, so, but they can be an, potentially be anonymous online and bully in a virtual way. Um, so engage in cyberbullying against the person who per perpetrated bullying in a traditional way against them. There's, there's a host of different reasons why somebody might do it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, power really is, a big factor in it. It makes me feel um, like I can be bigger or better than someone else. You know, it may, there's a debate in the literature about the degree to which people with low self-esteem or people with high self-esteem engage in both types of bullying, um, you know, cyberbullying and traditional bullying. That debate has, has still not been resolved. Um, but certainly we, th we know that people who have, um, you know, anxiety and people who have depression um, are targets oftentimes of um, bullying, but we also know that those are outcomes of being involved in bullying mm -hmm. as well. So I guess the other question is who do bullies generally target? I mean, I think in the traditional world, it was the, me growing up, it was the, the smaller kids, the, mm -hmm. maybe the smarter kids, the kids that were a little bit anxious, that were a little less, a uh, little insecure of themselves seemed to be the targets and, but that's also probably also the kind of the outcome of being bullied also. Yeah. You know, in a, in the virtual world, to be perfectly honest about it, anybody can be a target mm -hmm. of it. Um, you know, you, you say the wrong thing to somebody online or, you know, face to face, you could be a target of it. Um, you know, you, anybody in the online world, anybody has the potential to be a perpetrator and anybody has the potential to be a victim of mm -hmm. cyberbullying. I mean, if you look at social media, which is really that, you know, cyberbullying can take place via a number of different venues, text messaging, social media, and, you know, it just, there's so many different ways that it can take place, which is one of the sort of hazards of it. But right now I'm on young people's social media because that's how they're spending their time. It goes along that that would be the most common platform by which they're cyber, cyberbullying one another. Um, but, you know, you you don't like what they've posted, you, you know, you feel like somehow it's a threat against you or your group or whatever, then you're, you're going to be a target. Um, mm -hmm. So e even if it's not meant that way, you know, people, people are really um, sensitive sometimes to information that they feel like is said the wrong way. Um, mm -hmm. And that makes other people a target. Or, you know, you, you look at YouTube videos, people put express comments about YouTube videos, for example, well, if it disagrees with your, com your with, with your perspective on it, then you're basically going to get, they call it flaming. Uh, it's an online fight that takes mm -hmm. place on, um, in the virtual world. So, so you talked about flaming. Let's, what does kind of online cyberbullying look like, whether it's text messages, phones, social media? Let's talk about kind of what, what does it look like? So it can take a lot of different forms. Um, it can be 
um, you know, it be a written text, it can be disseminated through pictures. Um, and it can, and like I said, it can take a lot of different forms. So you can have online fights like flaming, you can have um, what's called um, outing and trickery. You can get somebody to disclose information to you like, oh no, you tell, tell me, you know, you tell me, you know, you've got a secret, tell, tell me, I won't tell anybody. And then you go and disseminate that information online. It can be sexting, you know, send me, send me, you know, Give me some, some pictures and you know, I won't share those pictures with it. Usually that's in the context of romantic relationships. Yeah. And then those pictures are disseminated. Um, I mean, there's, there's lots of different ways in which it can, can occur. Um, it, it, again, it can, it can just be, you know, just getting mad at somebody, um, not necessarily an online fight, but just getting mad at somebody and disseminating that, the content mm-hmm. of that, that disagreement. Would you include kind of revenge porn in cyberbullying? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. For sure. And, and I guess, you know, kind of a couple of the, the, the questions just like, okay, so what can someone who is being cyberbullying bullied do about it? So that, that's a great question. You know, it depends on the frequency with, with which it's happening. You know, if it happens, you know, maybe one time or twice, you know, typically we would recommend certainly not responding back um, because that sets up this you know, it's going to continue over and over again. Um, if it continues, particularly if we're talking about young people, um, then, you know, try to immediately block the person because that's mm-hmm. at least going to stop the torrent of messages. That doesn't mean that they're not going to go share information with other people, that the perpetrator is not going to go share information with other people or continue to leave it on, you know, other websites or, or things of that nature. Um, but depending on the age of the victim that we're talking about, we strongly encourage the victim to go and tell somebody, mm-hmm. um, specifically tell us to tell somebody in a position of authority to do something about it. What the research that we have done has shown is that, um, first of all, they, young people are not likely to tell at all. Yeah. If they do tell, um, they're most likely to tell a friend. I don't want to take anything away from that. That's, that's, they're at least telling somebody, um, but a friend is not in, in necessarily in a position to do anything about it. Um, mm-hmm. So we would prefer that they tell, you know, a parent, um, that they tell a teacher at school. And typically, the reason that they that we've done focus groups and they've the kids have talked about reasons that they don't tell those adult figures. Mm-hmm. And one reason is that they've always been afraid their parents will take the technology away. Um, you know, the the vehicle by which their child is being victimized. Yeah. Um, I'm a parent, um, you know, my kids are, are older now, but I, I understand that. But to to take that technology away, um, it, particularly with youth today, is in essence re-victimizing the child. Yeah. Um, so that that is certainly not how we would recommend. We would recommend um, really opening up those lines of communication um, between the parent and the child about, because, you know, these kids are so tech savvy. In many cases, they know more about the technology than the parent does. <laughs> um, and so, you know, if, if the parents can open up those lines of communication, and in one of our focus groups, and, and I've never forgotten this, um, one middle school student told us that they were okay with supervision, not snoopervision. In other words, they were okay with their parents looking at searching their local histories, you know, to see, you know, what they had been doing. Um, And, but they didn't want, for example, keystroke software installed on their computers, you know, they, 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 okay with supervision, but not supervision. The the difference between, yes, I'm going to hand over my device and you can look and see what's there versus you're surreptitiously monitoring me or you're, it's Mm -hmm. constant, uh, pervasive monitoring, so to speak. Absolutely, right. Because then it feels like an invasion of privacy as opposed to this trusting relationship that's been established between the parent and the child. And the, a parent appears to be acting out of true concern that, you know, oh, I understand that, this, that you know, there's cyber rolling going on. I want to make sure you're okay. You know, um, it, it, yeah, once it, once it crosses that line, it, becomes, it, seems, it does seem surreptitious then. Yeah. So... And, I, and I, I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist, so I, I'll get the terminology wrong here, I'm sure. Right. Uh, in, in terms of a person dealing with the emotional, psychological uh, results of being, or the feelings that they're going through uh, from being bullied, what kind of thing, what kind of issues or feelings are people going through and how do they work through those? Oh, there's so many. Um, they... Um 
victims of cyberbullying and traditional bullying for that matter, but, but specifically cyberbullying experience heightened levels of anxiety, higher levels of depression, um, heightened levels of suicidal ideation. Um, they have um, sleep problems. Oftentimes they engage in more aggressive behaviors themselves. They um, um, oftentimes, depending on the age of the person that you're talking about, um, they may um, increase like substance abuse. Um, mm-hmm. um, uh, how am I trying to say? The abuse of, of substances. Um, mm-hmm. They may increase vaping. They may abuse drugs. Um, they, they may be abuse alcohol. Um, it's, it's a long list of negative outcomes. And it's important to note that the effects of cyberbullying are in, so for, for kids that are involved in, or youth that are involved in both traditional bullying and cyberbullying, the effects are magnified even relative to negative consequences of being involved in traditional bullying. So these are not just, oh, well, you know, these, these are really just consequences of traditional bullying, not cyberbullying. No, mm-hmm. they are indeed consequences of cyberbullying, although they are magnified um, like an additive effect if they're involved in both types of, of bullying. Um, how they can deal with that, um, they, they really, they therapy would be a good recommendation, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, depending on how long the cyberbullying has taken place, you know, if it's just an isolated incident, then obviously the magnitude of those effects is going to be significantly less independent, depending on the severity of cyberbullying. But if it's taken place over a period of time, um, if they've lost, you know, they tend to isolate themselves. So loneliness is another um, outcome. So if they've isolated themselves, if they feel like all their friends are involved in this, they don't feel like they have any friends anymore, um, then who are they going to talk to about this? So they are going to need somebody. The other thing that we recommend is that, you know, schools really, because a lot of cyberbullying happens off of school grounds, but then it obviously impacts the performance at school. So academic issues become another um, problem. The, the young people don't want to go to school. Their grades fall. Um, they experience physical health problems, you know, stomach aches, headaches, things like that. Um, so which they can then use as the reason why they don't want to go to school. So, you know, schools are in in an interesting position with cyberbullying because it's happening off of school grounds and what's their role in that. But one of the things that we would like to suggest is, you know, obviously creating positive school climate should reduce the prevalence of any type of bullying, um, traditional bullying and cyberbullying. We also do research on psychological mattering, you know, how you can go about making other people feel like they are important or significant. So to the degree that schools can facilitate mattering um, mm-hmm. among the students at their school, then, you know, I don't, I, I think it would be misleading to say we're ever going to eliminate bullying in whatever form it takes, but to the degree that we can facilitate mattering um, in, within the context of this positive school climate, I certainly think it would go a long way towards um, reducing the frequency with which cyberbullying occurs. So, so is, is mattering kind of... Uh positive reinforcement and building good, you know, you're, you're balancing out kind of the, the negative events from cyberbullying with positive, positive reinforcement over a longer period of time. Yes. And it's really, you know, it, it, sometimes it's as simple as mattering. Like, you know, we've, there's, we didn't create these, but we've seen them that there's even like stickers that say you matter on it. Um, you know, and I think it's, there's programs um, that some schools have implemented that actually, you know, tell the kids through different activities and behaviors that you matter. Um, you know, kids who, um, let's imagine in the lunchroom, for example, you've got certain kids who are marginalized um, relative to others. So they're, they're sitting by themselves or they're sitting on the periphery. You know, those kids certainly don't feel like they matter. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so there's a host of things besides just cyberbullying um, that may negative outcomes that may result from that. Um, so to the degree that we can, can include, you know, make those kids feel like they belong, make them feel like they have friends, make them feel like they are contributing to the school environment. You know, you, you are an important person. You matter here. Even, even if it's just to one other person, we know that if a child um, or young, young person feels like they have even one other person that, that thinks that, thinks that they are important, mm-hmm. um, then it, it can, can make significant strides in terms of the mental and physical health of that individual. Is that the sort of thing where like participation in charity events helps people to see how they matter? That certainly would help. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and so going back to the uh, kind of the, 
the, the, the impacts and the side effects and, and, yeah. and the representation? Should parents be watching out? Is it kind of one of those general things where parents watch out for sudden changes in behavior, weight loss, suddenly listening to different music, that there's these significant shifts in personality? Yeah, the, 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 those are all warning signs. You know, the heightened anxiety, the withdrawal from social activity. Mm -hmm. um, that social isolation is a, is a really key warning sign. It can be a, it can be a warning sign of a lot of things, not just cyberbullying. But whether it's cyberbullying or something else, it's a warning sign that something is amiss. Um, yeah. So, yeah, parents do need to be on the lookout for those warning signs. And then, again, that's a way of opening up those, those lines of communication, um, you know, or maybe talking to, you know, other people that know them, you know, either friends or, you know, other people that are, you know, in the, in the school environment that may have observed similar behavior, but definitely paying attention to the warning signs. And we recommend the same thing with traditional bullying. And is that the same sort of thing where, you know, helping your, helping your kids who are not being bullied to be aware of what's going on with their friends and when they see shifts that they're talking to their friends and talking to parents and, and, and teachers and whatnot? Yeah, because, you know, one of the issues with cyberbullying is it's not just victims and perpetrators, it's also witnesses. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, the with cyberbullying, you know, your your bystanders or your witnesses often inadvertently pass along the information. You know, they may forward a text message or forward an email and, you know, they they may not even fully realize the, you know, who it's about or the content of that, but they, they get caught up in it themselves without realizing it. So to the degree that we can educate everybody, mm -hmm. you know, um, all the students, parents, you know, bus drivers, lunch personnel to what, look out for the warning signs and, and to act on those warning signs and then to, to report it. And, you know, the interesting, a lot of people say, well, I don't want to report it because then I might be the target of cyberbullying. Well, then let's use, if, if technology is the venue by which cyberbullying occurs, then let's make technology available as a means of reporting anonymously. Mm -hmm. um, so I totally understand why particularly students, other students might be afraid that they would then be targeted. That's that's not rocket science to, yeah. to understand that. So, but if that's the case, let's let's use the means by which the behavior is occurring to, to make anonymous reporting available for those students. And in a lot of the social media platforms, there are built-in tools to report harassment and inappropriate Absolutely. behavior. It's just the question of how effective are those tools? How quickly are, are, are they implemented and, yes. and how? And, and if they think it'll make a difference. You yeah. know, there's so many things, you know, we know with um, from some data that we've collected that with warning signs of, of potential school shootings that, you know, st students and, and young adults think that, well, you know, I know the warning signs, but I don't think it'll make a difference. Um, you know, then, well, so then they're not going to report them. So, you know, they've got to believe that it'll make a difference um, mm -hmm. in terms of cyberbullying if they, if they report it. Gotcha. And so we, we've been talking a lot about uh, cyberbullying of children. Is cyberbullying of adults kind of this, just the same thing, but people are older? Yes, <laughs> sadly. Um, it, knows, it knows no age boundary. Um, so, yeah, it happens in the workplace. Um, and you, it's You've got the same sort of basic issues. Um, now, it can occur. The power imbalance is a little less obvious um, in the workplace because, you know, you can have cyberbullying by supervisors to, you know, employees, um, but you, you're going to get you're going to get more like peer to peer um, mm -hmm. cyberbullying in the workplace. But in terms of the outcomes, you're going to have reduced job satisfaction. You're going to have higher turnover. You're still going to have the physical symptomology. You're still going to have higher levels of anxiety, depression, low self-esteem. The same outcomes are going to be experienced in the, in the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, and that is costly to an organization. You also are going to have an increase in what they call counterproductive work behaviors, sort of corresponds to, in a young person, um, aggressive behaviors that might develop. So it could be sort of, um, it could be outright aggression. It could be um, being passive aggressive. It could be slacking off on, you know, teamwork or job, you know, tasks, job tasks that you've been assigned. Um, so it, it morphs a, a teeny bit, um, but the, the overall manifestations are the same. Mm -hmm. And the venues by which it occurs are the same. And so what about outside of work when you have someone who is just on, let's just say social media for what, you know, they have a social media account and it's just people that they may not even have any physical real world contact with that it, that re it truly is, even if the person's name, you know, was true that it's Bob Smith, they're like, 
I, I don't know who Bob Smith is. I've never even met Bob Smith. Why is he coming after me this way? <laughs> but maybe they have met Bob yeah. Smith. And <laughs> Bob Smith may be there, the person in the cubicle next to them at work. They, Bob Smith just, is just using an assumed name. So, but, but that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that we don't, you know, we don't know. In cyberbullying, we don't know if the person's name is truly yeah if, if they're truly who they claim to be um but but adults can be can be cyberbullied you know it doesn't have to happen in a work setting um it, it can but can, it can also happen you know like you were just saying outside in the real world just like it does with with young people mm -hmm. so you know pe people are people um you know and you know with adults um you know particularly <laughs> particularly in the political climate that we're living in today um you know people get upset with comments that other people make. So they, you know, if people don't hold the same beliefs or, you know, just, it doesn't have to be politics. It can be anything. Then they can, they can make someone, somebody can make somebody else a target for mm -hmm. bullying. Have, have you seen an increase in cyberbullying with uh, corresponding with COVID and people being at home and not being, uh, you know, if you if you, if you're not physically near the person, maybe there's a little a more feeling of anonymity. Yeah, that's such a good question, and that's something that I thought would I thought that the prevalence of, of cyberbullying would skyrocket really during COVID because people were using their technology all the time. Um, and and you're right, they then they had that opportunity to be more anonymous, um, potentially be more anonymous. Um, the prevalence rates did not change hmm. markedly, um, which was somewhat surprising, you know, and I can't give you a, a for sure explanation for that. I would speculate, though, that during COVID, you know, people were so isolated that they really needed those social connections um, and so maybe relied on them more in a positive way than than they do under normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so worked on facilitating positive interactions as opposed to distancing themselves by you know, engaging in cyberbullying behavior. Is it also possible that it's just a, I don't want to say lack of opportunity, but a lack of, oh gosh, it sounds horrible, a lack of material? <laughs> in, in a, <laughs> like, like, in a sense, yeah. like, if I haven't interacted with the person, all yeah. I could, you know, all I've seen them on is, is on a Zoom screen in class, I can only tease yeah. them about the background screen. Whereas if they're in school, I could tease them about, you know, the way they walk, the way they talk, who they hang, who they're physically hanging out with. But when it's only online, there's, there's just less, uh, oh gosh, less material. Sounds like a horrible way to phrase well, it, but, but the no, less but context. It's appropriate. Yes. No, that's a good point. And that's assuming that they're cyberbullying. The cyberbullying is between people that know each other, mm -hmm. you know, total strangers. You know, um, I think it's sort of a zero sum game, but um, but yeah, I think if it's if it's people that know each other, then yeah, they context. There's there's less context. Or less, yeah, um, I don't know the material sort of fits it better, but um, yeah, yeah, less information. And I I, I guess the uh, other than you know therapy and working with adults, are there any other kind of general ways that people can learn? kind of tip, tips and tricks that people can learn about letting the bullying kind of roll off their back a little bit and not get under their skin? So I think, it, you know, that's human nature um, to sort of, and I, I think sometimes, to be fair, I think some people don't even recognize that what's occurring is cyberbullying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I unlike traditional bullying, you know, cyberbullying, like, you know, people send, you know, they get an email and then it's like, oh, cool. you know, you just immediately send something back quickly without even thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so I think part of what people need to learn is just sort of um, on, on, they call it netiquette, it's online etiquette. Um, you know, I think we need to sort of hit the pause button sometimes. If somebody sends us information and it's, um, you know, inflammatory and we have a tendency to want to just re immediately respond back in a similar way, and that's just going to set up that flaming war. I think we sometimes we need to hit the pause button. Um, you know, you can block them. Um, doesn't mean they're not going to try some other. You know, we all have a lot of different social media platforms and stuff that we're on, so people can get at us from a lot of different directions. Um, but I think if we hit the pause button and maybe articulate more carefully how we respond back, then that's going to at least take some of the fuel from the fire that's that's going on 
again, easier with somebody that you know mm -hmm. than somebody that you don't know. If somebody, if, if you don't know somebody, they don't really care in, in that context. Um, so, so that's one way. If it's, again, if it's continuing, I think blocking and reporting is, is going to be your best, your best bet. Mm -hmm. um, and then just hope that the, again, most of the time, social media platform will, will deal with it. Yeah, it's kind of a okay. pra practicing de-escalation techniques, I guess. Absolutely. That's a great way of putting it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then education, just really educating and having these conversations. Um, you know, cyberbullying has been around for a, for a while now. Um, you know, and we hope that people are aware of it. But I think sometimes, particularly among young people, there is there's such a familiarity with the technology and um, and honestly such a familiarity with cyberbullying sometimes that it becomes somewhat normative um but cyberbullying should never become normative mm -hmm. because of the outcomes that can follow you know not everyone you know there's individual differences that are going to mediate um who is going to experience um cyberbullying outcomes to the greatest extent um you know suicidal ideation for example mm -hmm. you know not everyone is going to experience that Part of it's going to be a function of how the cyberbullying occurs. Part of it's just going to be a function of the temperament of the of the person. But the fact that anybody experiences it, you know, if I'm the perpetrator of cyberbullying, I don't know whether yeah. that it could have that impact on the person. Um, so, you know, a little perspective taking goes a long way. And, you know, not everybody's going to do that. But I think to the degree that we can educate people more about these are the consequences. You know, if you engage in this behavior, this is what may happen. Um, and, you know, we've, got, we've put out a couple of curriculum guides um, for um, kids in grades three through, three through five and kids in grades six through 12 to try to do that, to try to educate them, to try to get them to engage in some perspective taking, to try to recognize what they're in one of them, there's a game um, it's called, is, is it or isn't it? Um, and it's, to, um, it's to, to help people recognize, it's like a board game, to recognize, is this cyberbullying or isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. And if you think it is, give some reasons why. If you think it isn't, also give some reasons why. Um, and again, it facilitates conversation. Yeah, an example of cyberbullying uh, coming to an extreme outcome was my interview with Tina Meyer, whose daughter uh, committed suicide as a result of cyberbullying. And while that's not every outcome, that's definitely where it can go. It can go very quickly, unfortunately. Yes, yes. And the fact that even one, and she, and she is certainly not alone yeah. um, in that, but the fact that even one, and there's been more, um, should, ne should, should never happen. I mean, you know, that's, it's a horrible, horrible outcome of a behavior that, you know, really should never happen, but we know that it, it does with, with all too great a, a frequency. And I assume, you know, when I was, when I was in school, you know, there, there was a certain amount of, I don't want to say bullying was tolerated to some extent, but there was a little bit of, you know, boys will be boys, that's okay, you know, as long as it doesn't escalate beyond a certain point. Um, but to me, I think now you really just, you you don't want to assume that things will get better. Oh, it'll, it'll just go away. It was just a one-time incident that there really needs to be not an overreactive response, but an appropriate response and support from parents and family and not just, well, just let's just let this play out and, and they'll be fine. Well, and the thing to remember about cyberbullying too is in the virtual world, there's a, it's the publicness of it. Um, you know, in traditional bullying, again, I don't, I'm not trying to minimize traditional mm -hmm. bullying at all, but it, it's visible unless it's recorded, in which case it would have a cyberbullying component to it, but it's visible to those who happen to see it. Um, which usually was very few, but there's a publicness to cyberbullying. Um, and then, you know, depending on what form it took, it's there forever. Yeah. Um, you know, pictures, for example, that are, you know, used to cyberbully others. Um, you know, those, e even if they're ultimately taken down, they've been downloaded how many times? Um, you know, so to be resurrected, who knows when, um, you know, so, you know, to be a victim of that and sort of have that always in the back of your mind of wondering when will that reappear and what will happen with that. And, you know, that would, that would be extremely unnerving. Um, so I, there's, there's, there's a different quality yeah. to cyberbullying that did not characterize traditional bullying. 
there's a permanence to it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I, 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 I suppose we should look at it from the, the opposite side of it as well is more and more employers are looking at people's social media when they're hiring people and looking at yes. uh, a more uh, heuristic look of people of well, who it, not does this person have the skill set to do this job, but how does this person interact with their community? You know, if they're being a total jerk online to people, but they have a good skill set, an employer might go, well, I, you know, I, I just don't want to bring that behavior into my office. No, and, because it would. <laughs> and now they yeah. can look back and see, well, my goodness, this person's been bullying people or, or yeah. saying nasty things online about people, being really confrontational, being a troll. Like, do, do I, and, and you know, you might have been that way in, you know, in, in junior high, high school or college and, and learned your lesson, but now you're going to have to deal with the permanence of a history of how you behaved. And not only that, but we know that there tends to be, that those patterns still tend to repeat. So they do, do they really learn? Um, mm -hmm. You know, so we know that young people who bullied and bullied others in, you know, middle and high school also tend to re repeat that behavior in college. And it's not going to stop when they get into the workplace. Um, so the the employers would be well served um, to probably not hire that person um, because the behavior can occur. So, so on that note, we talked about what you know parents could do of kids who are being bullied. What about parents who have a kid who's doing the bullying? Okay, it's been discussed. It's open. Like, how do you help change that pattern and break that pattern so it doesn't continue in a, into adulthood? Or if you're an adult and you have this as a pattern from your youth and you don't want it to be a pattern when you go to work, how do how do we how do we deal with that? So, uh, <laughs> um, I had a student um, who worked with me on a, a research team one year, and she had. She, she had been a perpetrator of cyberbullying when she was in um, middle school. And, and, she, and we were studying cyberbullying on the team. And she, while, while, I, while she was aware at the time that that's what she was doing, she wasn't aware of, A, the magnitude with which she was doing it or the consequences of mm -hmm. it until she worked with me on the research team and we were studying it. Um, mm -hmm. And she, she was really troubled um by by <laughs> learning about herself basically um I'm not trying to make light of that but it was um so I think so basically she got a lot of insight um by being educated on the topic mm -hmm. so I think that's one factor is is education um and as part of that education perspective taking um you know part of it may be um doing um and, and she, <laughs> ironically at the time that she was that this this perpetrator was on the team. Um, another one of my students had been um, pretty severely victimized by cyberbullying. So they had lengthy conversations with one another. Um, so I, I think that can also be a way to help perpetrators understand, truly understand. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing for me to sit here and say, oh, well, you know, if you're a victim, you're going to have you know, heightened anxieties, depressions. But that doesn't mean as much as if somebody who has been a victim. Um, sits there and says, this is how it made me feel. This mm -hmm. is the law. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat, you know, for months and months. You know, I didn't want to go to school. I felt like I had lost, you know, when it's the I, uh, this is how it made me feel. Um, that has a whole different impact. Um, so, you know, with cyberbullying and a lot of other behaviors, I think, you know, the the one-on-one -on -one contact with somebody who maybe not, maybe not the their victim, but a, a victim nonetheless, I think is a great way to help people understand the true impact of a behavior that they, they just thought was, you know, in, in many cases, I mean, it is intended to harm, but in many cases, they're not aware of the, the degree of the harm. Um, mm -hmm. So in some cases, they're just like, oh, it was, well, it was meant to be funny. Um, well, funny for whom, you know, yeah. so I think that's a way to get them to truly understand so that they stop the behavior. And I'm sure therapy can help people oh, as absolutely. well. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Therapy has all sorts of positive benefits. Oh, isn't it though? <laughs> For sure. So earlier you talked about guides that you have. Your yeah. department has produced. Can, can people find those guides online? Yeah. So those um, the two um, curriculum guides um, were published by Hazelton. Um, so they can be found at hazelton.org. Um, and then we also have a book um, that 
um, it's called, <laughs> I'm not sure what it's called. <laughs> One of the books is called Cyberbullying, colon, Bullying in the Digital Age. And it's published by Wiley. And then the other one, um, I'm not the first author of this book. It's by Giametti, G-I-U-M-A-T-T-I, um, and Kowalski. And it's called Cyberbullying in Schools, Workplaces, and Romantic Relationships, colon, The Many Lenses and Perspectives of Electronic Bullying. And that was published by Rutledge. And we'll make sure to link to both of those in the show notes. And obviously, any, okay, any anywhere books are sold, they can be found. That's awesome. Amazon, yes. Barnes & Noble. Yes, they're all, that's, they're, they're all on there. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the curriculum guides may not be. The curriculum guides may, may just be a Hazleton thing. But um, we'll, we'll find those and link to them as well. That'd be great. Okay. And that's if people, awesome. people want to follow you on social media, where can they find you? Or are you um, even so on social media? <laughs> Shockingly, <laughs> given, given what I study, um, I am. I'm on Twitter. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Facebook, um, Snapchat. <laughs> Pretty much all of them. Instagram. Um, okay, and, and, and maybe sl- I guess suppose they're on topic. Do you find that people try to cyberbully you because you write about cyberbullying? Um. Not yet. <laughs> not, um, not that we're advocating that. Yes, um, I hope not. Um, no, and you know that's a that's a good question. Um, you know, hopefully, um, you know, the only time that I can think of that I I have been cyber bullied um, was in a survey that we did of of cyber bullying, um, and there was a um, there was a glitch in the survey, and so it 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 repeated, and. Um, the it it really made a few people really angry um so they it was an online survey so they had some um really choice words to say to us um and um so and you know this was it's interesting that you asked that question because i had been studying cyberbullying for years at that point and i fully understood why they were upset um, you know, we had, we had checked the survey over and over and over again. I, I still don't know what hat might had the glitch in it. I understood why they were angry. Um, didn't, didn't understand why they had to be as mean as they were, but I, I really did understand the source of their, of their irritation. Um, and it still hurt my feelings. Um, and I remember being really bothered by that because I thought I'm a grown woman and was really upset by the by the nature of the things that they said. And it gave me such perspective of imagining being an 11, 12 or 13 year old and being just relentlessly cyber bullied um, and not understanding. You know, I at least had context. Mm -hmm. What if, what if you didn't? Um, So in in retrospect, it was probably a good thing that it happened um, because it really gave me a lot of insight and perspective on what it would be like. Um, and it would not be good. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I had a lot of of context and perspective for mine, but it, um, I cannot imagine being a young person and going through that. You understand, I I understood why the outcomes are what they are. Yeah. And, and I've, and I've had those as well. I've run what is my IP address.com for 22 years now. And occasionally I'll just, get some horrifically nasty email and it's yeah. just like that hurts and like why yeah. would you and, and i was like why would you say such horrible things to someone <laughs> like it, it, in a mindset where i always try to go is like and it, it, it's it's for my own benefit more than than theirs just trying to feel like well, what's going on in their life that they felt they had to respond to this issue with with that amount of vitriol like there's some, there's something like, you know, with, with, with a survey going goofy, yeah, it's annoying. And like, I totally understand yeah. it, but like, but you think what else is going on where they chose to, to respond to the survey issue mm-hmm. in with this, with this response, there has to be something like, I always try to figure to t- turn it around and say, well, what's going on that, that they would feel that they would have to respond this way to that situation. And I think that's a really great way to handle it. But I don't think an 11-year-old 
has the perspective to be able to do that or a 12 year old or even no. a high school student. Um, Cause I think you're right. Clearly there's something else going on with that person. Um, you know, but you know, what do we do with kids who cannot immediately go there? Yeah. You know, who just immediately assumes that there's some that they're, that they're bad or that there's, cause that's what they're being told. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that's where we've got to do the work is to try to get them to understand that this is about the perpetrator not about about them i think that is a perfect note to end on that it's it's not about the target it's about the perpetrator yes and helping yes. people to figure that out oh this was so much fun thank yeah. you so much for coming on the podcast today thank you so much i've enjoyed talking to you so much such a such a great topic that that we need to have conversations about absolutely